Prayer makes for better believers. What we want to do is to learn how to pray better for believers so believers will be better. Now you follow along. I'm reading, of course, out of the New Living Translation. The scriptures will be up when I'm talking. He says, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. And then in verse 11, We also pray that you will be strengthened with all His glorious power, so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Let's pray. Fathers, we come now to your word. Lord, we ask that you will reach into our fears, deep down into our hearts. Lord, that you'll cause us to want to pray better. And Lord, that as we learn today, as we read even this afternoon these words over again, Father, that you'll make us better at praying for one another. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will teach us that he'll reach down into our hearts, into our minds, and open up our hearts and minds to your truth. Father, we believe in you. And so, Lord, we pray to you, having confidence that in Jesus Christ, you will give us what we ask. And we pray for this in Christ's name. Amen. Sometimes we don't know what to pray for other believers. Sometimes it helps when you know other believers. Sometimes it doesn't. You can pray for believers better by studying what Paul is going to talk about here in verses 9 through 14. You realize that Paul didn't know everybody in Colossae. He met a couple of three or four or five people that knew him there. But many of the people there had never met Paul face to face. He'd never met them face to face. And so Paul is going to say, here's what I've been praying for you people whom I've never met. You can pray these seven things for everybody who's a believer. And if you'll do that, God will work in their life and make them a better believer in Jesus Christ. Another thing I want to point out to you is the difficulty in this passage is that Paul barely takes a breath in these verses. There really is about only one main verb in the whole deal. And so he just starts firing off and da 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 down he goes. And it's, it's a little difficult. And so some people will say, break these up a little differently. But I see seven things here that uh, we should pray for other believers. The first one is, we ought to pray for them to completely know God's will. Look what he says in verse 9. He said, we've not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. That's the verb. That's it. From then on, everything else just kind of goes with that. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Give you complete knowledge of his will. He adds a word to the word knowledge here that means full knowledge. Somebody made up the word before Paul. But it's the idea of putting these two things together. It's not just that you'll know God's will, but you'll have complete knowledge of God's will. That's something very important for us to know. We need to know as believers what God wants us to be and what God wants us to do. It's much more important what God wants you to be than it is to know what God wants you to do. If you are what God wants you to be, what he wants you to do will come much easier. God's will has a lot more to do with what he wants you to be than with where he wants you to be it. I don't know if that's good English or not. You can do the will of God anywhere in the world. You can be at work and do God's will. I'm going to say something that's totally wrong. All right. You can be in the wrong job and do God's will. I don't really think you can be in the wrong job. There are some jobs that would be wrong. But by and large, the will of God is not about what job you have, not about where you are. It's not about what house you've got. It's not really about what town you live in. It's more about are you understanding what God has saved you to be, what God is making you to be, how God is working in your life. Who you are to be is a lot more important than what you are to be or what you are to do. He says, you know something about the will of God. You know a few things about the will of God. You've heard the gospel. He talks about that with them in verse 6. 
They've heard the good news. Epaphras has told you the good news, verse 7. So you know that God wants you to be saved in Jesus Christ. He wants you to put your faith and trust in Him. You know that's the will of God for you. He said, I want you to come to a more full understanding of what God's will really is for you. The will of God, as we studied January 1st, Romans 12, 1 and 2, is you to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. It is God's will that you become like His Son, Jesus Christ. Everybody here knows some of God's will. We need to be praying for one another that we will increase our knowledge of what God's will is. None of us know completely all the will of God for our life. Nobody in here knows completely what God wants for us. We don't even know that we're reading the Word of God perfectly. Have you ever read the Word of God and said, wow, I didn't see that before? Have you been through the Bible more than once? Have you ever read through the Bible more than once? The next time you read it through, doesn't it, something else stands out to you? Some of us are doing this 10-section uh, challenge in the Bible. Read 10 different chapters in the Bible, 10 different sections. And one of the things that we're discovering is it points out things that, well, wow, that's like this over here and this over there. And it makes you look at things a little differently because you're so confused. You're trying to figure out how all this is going, and it, sometimes that's good because it makes you look at the Bible in a different way. And you're trying, God is trying to communicate to us, this is what God's will is. Our knowledge now is partial and fragmentary knowledge, but one day it's absolutely going to be complete in Christ. I really like to pray for things where you can't lose. And if you pray according to the will of God, you know you can't lose. God always wants believers to increase in our knowledge of His will, to know better, to know more about what God wants us to be and what God wants in our life. You can pray for people in this church, believers in your family, our missionaries this week. You can pray, Lord, help this missionary to know better your will. Bring them to complete knowledge of the will. And Lord, while I'm at it, I pray for the people they're working with, the believers that they're gathering around them as they are beginning churches or as they're pastoring churches, as they're trying to lead people in there, that the people in that church will come to know your complete knowledge of what it is you want for them to do. The second thing he tells us in this verse is not only that you have complete knowledge of his will, but that he give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Usually, we approach decisions on the basis of human wisdom. Now, don't deny that. We do. He said, I don't want you to do this based on human thinking. Let me give you an example of human thinking. Wow. Somebody thought that was a good idea. I don't even know what he's going to try to do going down that thing. I know what I would be trying to do if somebody pushed me down that thing. I'd be trying to survive all the way to the bottom and not be broken up probably on the other side of that pit, because I probably would land in the wrong spot. Sometimes we think certain things are so, we think it's a good idea. In our mind, we're thinking, oh yeah, that's a really good thing. It's not. We sometimes base our thinking on human knowledge. In chapter 2, verse 8, he says this, Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies or high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking. There's a lot of stuff that sounds really smart, Sounds really intellectual. The problem is, it's absolutely wrong. It's absolute folly to do what these people are saying. But it sounds very philosophical. It's, and I like the way it's translated here, high-sounding nonsense. It's not, but it sounds high. It sounds like, wow, he says absolutely nothing, but he says it so very, very well. It just draws you in, and you're thinking, that's something I really ought to get involved with. That's not spiritual wisdom. It's not based upon human thinking and human understanding. It's not based at all on the world's ideas. The last part of that verse says, high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. What's he talking about, the spiritual powers of this world? It is the world's approach to spirituality. Here's an example of the world's approach to spirit. If you are living right spiritually, if you really are in touch with the universe, you can walk through hot coals and not burn your feet. Doesn't that sound really spiritual? I mean, that's like something a guru would do. And so these must be spiritual people because they're able to walk through this fire. Let me bring it down to something a little more hick. 
to show you how stupid that is. There are some people who believe that the way to show your faith is to handle poisonous snakes. If you're really spiritual, you can handle copperheads and even rattlesnakes. And if they bite you, you won't die. Now, there's a flaw in that. People get bit, and you know what happens to them? They die. They obviously didn't have enough faith. That's the human idea of spirituality. They're thinking about it from a human point of view. There's a way that certainly seems pious. It seems like, wow, if these people, they must have tremendous amounts of faith that they're able to do that. They must be really spiritual because that's the way the world looks at spirituality. That's the worldly idea of spirituality. That is not God's idea. Spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding is based upon Christ through his known word. You and I are not going to hear the apostles speak to us. You will never have to wonder if one day on the marquee I'm going to have out there, the apostle Paul will be here today to speak to us. They're not around anymore, but their words, what they left us, is here. Some people will say, well, I, I just emphasize the words in red in my Bible, the words that Jesus spoke. You know who wrote those down? The apostles. You don't know anything about Jesus and what Jesus taught except what the apostles said. That's how we get it. That's where spirituality comes from. Back in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, he says this. Here's real spirituality. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. See the connection with Colossians? We're not telling you words that come from human wisdom, from philosophy and empty deceit, high-sounding nonsense. He says, instead we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. What you have in your hand, in the Word of God, whether in written or you've got it in electronic form, but what you have are spiritual words. Not mystic words, but words given by the Holy Spirit of God to men whom Christ authorized to speak on his behalf. They are spiritual words. If you think you're spiritual, acknowledge that this is the authority for all things spiritual. And if your spirituality is not based upon what God has said in his word, will you allow me to say, well, I'm going to say it anyway, you're not spiritual. I don't care if you can walk across hot coals. I don't care if you commune with an angel every morning. You're not spiritual if what you believe and what you teach does not match up with what God has already said in his word. I don't care how much fasting you do. I don't do a lot of fasting, obviously. Don't look at me that way. A lot of you don't either. I don't care what you give up. I don't care how many times you pray. I don't care how much communion you take. I don't care how mystical you are. Paul is saying in the book of Colossians, as well as in the book of 1 Corinthians, you're not spiritual unless you're following the words of the Spirit of God. Spirituality is not something we feel. It's something that has been given to us objectively in Christ. The feelings sometimes follow. We need to pray that God will make other believers spiritual in their wisdom and understanding. Third thing, we want to pray for believers to live pleasing to God. We want to honor God and please Him in everything that we do. Living a life that is pleasing to God. Verse 10, he says, When you have complete knowledge and when you have spiritual wisdom and understanding, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. It will always honor and please the Lord. Why? Because it's coming from the inside out. It's based on God's Word. You're living out God's Word in the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to be living those things out in the world. And God will be pleased. He'll be honored by the way that we live. We need to pray for believers to produce good works. Good works. Look at the last part of the verse. It says, your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. Every kind of good fruit. Well, what is good fruit? Well, it's good works. Literally, that's what he's saying there. I think when they translated good fruit, they're trying to include the fruit of the Spirit. The good works will follow if you are living spiritually and you understand God's Word and God's way. We need to be praying for believers to produce good works. It's the logical fruit of knowing God's will when we produce those things. It will come about. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says this, For we are God's, I like this, masterpiece version I learned it in said we are God's workmanship that's true 
But what God did, he did a masterpiece. You don't think of yourself that way, do you? Listen, what God is doing in your life, he is making you into his masterpiece. You realize the angels are looking at you and amazed? Well, of course they're amazed. Water and dirt, dust of the earth is becoming like Christ, like God. Isn't that amazing? That's more amazing than dirt becoming a tree. You are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus. When did you do that? When we trusted Christ as Savior. We became a new creature in Christ so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Your life's not pointless. God has good things he's doing in you and through you. When we yield ourselves to God, when we live according to his will, when we follow the Spirit's teaching, when all of these things are clicking, it's all working, God is producing in us the good things he wanted to do He's producing through us and doing through us the good works he has designed for each one of us to do. And God is pleased with his creation. We're not saved by good works, but we're saved to do good works. You can pray that for people. Pray also for believers to increasingly know God. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. If you want to know God, you've got to read the word and you've got to do it. If you read it and do it, then you'll find out God was right. And as we say, duh, of course God was right. If you read the word and you don't do it, you don't live according to it, you won't find out that God is right. If you read the word and you believe what God says and you live that out, then God says, see how that works? Now let me tell you something else about me. And you not only come to know God's will better, but here it's saying you're going to come to know God better. What did John say about knowing God? Well, actually, he's quoting Jesus in his prayer, John 17. I pray that they may know you. Whom to know is life everlasting. You know what eternal life consists of? It's knowing God as he really is. Can you imagine anything better than spending eternity in the presence of God and just marveling and learning and seeing more and more about, wow, God is really great. He really is. I mean, we know that, but not like we're going to know it. The more you do what God says, the more you live according to God's word, the more you see that God really is right, that he's true, you can count upon him. You're going to get to know God better and better. He's going to show you more and more about himself. Now, you've got to realize this is going to take a while because God is infinite in his perfections. It means that there's no way you're going to come to the end of God's love. You know, way you're going to come to where I know as much as God. I have all the wisdom of God. I've got it available. I don't have it. But God always knows more than you do. God is always gooder than you are. Not good English either. God is always, but he is. He's gooder than you are. He's most gooder than you are. You get the point. And we're going to spend all of our time here and eternity in just marveling at that and praising him because we're going to still be seeing things about God. We're not going to have complete and full knowledge of the infinite. We're going to be much better than we are now. But, you know, we can get better. Let's pray that one, for one another that we'll get better. you got somebody, you don't know what to pray for them. They're a believer. Pray that they'll know God better. They'll do his will, and they'll get to know God better and better. Verse 11, he says, We also pray that you'll be strengthened with all his glorious power, so you have the endurance and patience you need. All of his power. Two different kinds of words here for power. The idea of being strengthened is being able to, perform, being able to put forth the strength that you need to do something. And the the second word that he uses there is the idea of the power to rule or to control. He said, I'm going to pray that you'll be strengthened with all of his glorious power so that you'll have what you need, the endurance and patience you need. And one thing you should learn about the Christian life is try to avoid praying for patience. Because God said that's something you have to learn experientially. It's not a theoretical, no, you pray for patience, God will bring stuff in your life, or you have to, so you want to learn patience? All right, here, let me give you this. And it's not going to change, and you've got to endure it. You see, the endurance, it's the word that means you're, you're able to stay under the load. You remember the exercise, uh, guys, where you sit down and you're back against the wall? Remember this one? Hold your hands out like this and hold them out for, till the coach says drop it. It takes endurance. And the patience means, I'll say the word, it's macrothumia. Thumia means trouble. It's, it's the ability macro. you got a massive amount of ability to handle trouble that comes. Affliction, troubles. He says, I'm going to pray for you. That God will so strengthen you with all of his power that you'll have the endurance and patience you need. You can stand anything and glorify your God. That's good. 
Let me point out three things here. We talked about seven things we ought to pray. Let me encourage you with three things we got. Reasons for joyful thanksgiving. At the end of verse 11, there's a phrase, may you be filled with joy. Some people take it verse 11. Uh, here it takes it, I think, correctly, transitioning right into verse 12. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He's enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. One of the reasons we have for joy is we got to share in the inheritance of Christ. Whatever Christ is going to get, and what's Christ going to get? Everything. You now, by faith in Jesus Christ, have a share in that. You got an inheritance coming to you, and it's an eternal inheritance. You got a part in that. Maybe you don't have a lot of money right now. There's coming a time when you're going to be fabulously wealthy. You're going to be living in the house of the God who owns everything. He's going to supply all your needs for all eternity. He's going to supply things you just want. You got to share in the inheritance. You didn't have that before you got saved. The only thing you had to look forward to before you trusted Christ as Savior was losing everything. Everything you did have, everything you possibly could have earned, everything you possibly somebody could have given you, you're going to lose it all and you're going to lose it forever. But in Christ, you have all the inheritance that will not pass away. It's an eternal inheritance. You've got to share in the inheritance. We ought to rejoice in that for ourselves and for those that we're praying for. But man, this is great. You've got it all. Secondly, we can rejoice because he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. We've transferred from darkness to light. We didn't know anything and what we knew was wrong. And God said, I'm taking you from that darkness and I'm bringing you over into the light. Since I've had my eye problem, my sight's a little precious to me. Can you imagine being blind? You were born that way, spiritually, until God opened your eyes to the light. You didn't know, and what you did know was wrong. Remember the three guys trying to describe the elephant? One of them says like a fire hose because he had a hold of the trunk. One of them said he's like a tree because he's got this big leg I'm feeling. It's, it's a tree. The other one had a hold of the tail, and he said it's a stinky bush. Well, what you think about depends on where you are because you're blind. That's where we were before. God has taken you from the domain of darkness, where darkness ruled your life and brought you into the light of God. That's worth everything. I'd rather be dirt poor. Rather not, I'd rather be lower than dirt poor. I'd rather have nothing but know Jesus and know the truth of the gospel than to be fabulously wealthy and have no idea what's going to happen to me when I die. Have no wisdom for this life other than the smarts I can figure out from my greedy friends around me. No, we've been rescued. That's a good way of translating it. We've been rescued from darkness and transferred the light into the kingdom of his dear son. Third thing we're blessed with, he purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Who purchased our freedom? His dear son, he purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Not only have we been rescued from darkness to light, but we've been brought into the place where we are free. The imagery here for the people of Colossae, and particular for Onesimus, He's a former runaway slave returning to his master who is a believer in Colossae. He's still owned by Philemon. How did Philemon get him? He bought him in the marketplace of slaves. He purchased the man. He said, your freedom's been purchased by Jesus Christ. The price was paid, now get this, for you. God paid the price for you. He said, I'll pay for that one's sin. It's paid. It's paid. Not only did he pay the price of God's justice, when the Son of God purchased our freedom from sin by giving his life to satisfy the debt, God was showing his love because he followed through with that by forgiving us our huge debt of sin that none of us could pay. You're free from the penalty of your sin. God has forgiven it all, and he paid for it himself. If we had nothing else, that would be a tremendous possession to have. You realize, child of God, that all the guilt for your sin, past, present, and future, was purchased, paid for, bought. The price was paid on the cross when Jesus died on the cross for you, for you. And now you're free from the guilt of sin. You are forgiven of your sins, and you stand before God, and God will never condemn you for your sins because he's accepted you in Jesus Christ. Brethren, we ought to pray for one another. Because God will answer these prayers for the people around us. Will you do that this week? I'm going to try this week to take the church directory 
and pray this for each one of you, each family in this church, each person in this church. I'm going to go through it. I'm going to try this week, all week, to be praying this for you. I don't know what day you'll be on, but one of these days this week, I'll be praying for you and praying specifically these seven things for you this week. Will you pick somebody else out in the church and pray it for them? I'm also going to be praying it for myself. I'm a little selfish that way. You be a little selfish too. Pray it for yourself that we might truly come to the place where we thank God for what he's given. Father, your glorious power is sufficient. It's more than sufficient. Lord, it's really all we need. You have given us all that we need to make these seven things happen in our lives and the lives of the people around us. These things ought to be true of every believer. Lord, I pray that you will cause us to think on these things this week. And Lord, that as we do, that you will fill our lives with joy as we think about all you've given to us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.